so, so hard. Well, I just want to give a warm welcome. We are so excited that you are here to celebrate Palm Sunday with us. If you're watching from online or here in the room, we're just thankful you guys are here. So let's take a minute, say hi to your neighbor, make a new friend, and we'll jump back into worship.
give the Lord a hand this morning. Come on now, it's Palm Sunday. This is what we did. Palm Sunday, they were filling the streets with praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we bless your name. We love you. We love to love you. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. God, we just ask you to bless us this morning as we've gathered to sing of your praises, to remember you and your faithfulness. God, we ask you to bless us and our families. Oh, we love you, Lord. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, so be it. Amen and amen. Well, good. Go ahead and have a seat, if you will. It's good to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. Hey, as you're doing that, real quick, just grab your bullets, and I want to highlight just a couple of things. Uh, hey, how about them kids this morning, huh? They're looking sharp. They did really good. So appreciate our Grace Kids team, and last week, a bunch of babies up here and dedicating life, and this week, our kids up here praising the Lord. I thought, man, I could get used to this, just seeing the, the youthfulness of God's faithfulness in our families. Um, well, we're glad you're here. For those of you that may be newer around here, we're glad you're here. You're welcome to always come be a part of our, our services, classes, groups. There's so many things that are happening. I want to encourage you just to familiarize yourself with the bulletin, look at our website, lots of things that are going on that touch just about every age group, just about every day of the week, maybe finding a new friend, using your gifts to bless somebody else. And if you're newer, there's a Connect card right here in front of you and up in the, the balcony as well and online, you can see how to interact with us. In an easy way, if you'd like to, just to find out more about who we are as a church or maybe more about Jesus. Maybe you're still just kind of trying to figure out what this whole Christianity thing is about. Maybe you have questions about the Bible. Maybe you have a prayer request where you're just going through a hard time. We would love to pray with you. That's an easy way to interact with us right there on that tab. You can see how to do that there. Those of you that come ready to give, we do that at the end of the services on your way out. If you wanna give that way, there's offering boxes at all the exits or, of course, online as well. Not a, a, a lot that I wanna specifically highlight except for the fact that today is Palm Sunday, which initiates Holy Week, which means that this week's schedule is a little bit different. So our midweek service that we typically have on Wednesday, we will not be having that, and that goes for students as well. I think there's a mishap in the bulletin. There's no uh, student service this Wednesday, no midweek service in the chapel. Everything is moved to Friday. If you're newer around here, our Good Friday service is off the chart. It's the time when we come together, we reflect on the goodness of the Lord, His commitment to us. We take communion together as a spiritual family. You don't wanna miss that on Good Friday. And then, of course, on Saturday and Sunday, we'll be having our Resurrection Easter services and, you know, we have these at all of the um, info booths around the campus, just invitations. You know, there's a couple times a year when people are typically open to set foot inside of a church, or they typically wouldn't. And this is one of those times. It's Easter weekend. So invite people, friends, family, even ask the Lord. Last night we were just, just talking about the idea of saying, okay, okay, God, put somebody on my heart. Maybe it's a specific classmate, a coworker that I could invite, say, hey, come and sit with me, and then maybe go to lunch after or something. Ron will be giving a very direct and simple gospel message. We're believing for our friends and families to be saved, for people to experience forgiveness of sins. And when you experience that new life, it's a friend for eternity, I promise that people will thank you for inviting them and bringing uh, them with you. So I say next weekend, let's pack this place out. Grab some of those on your way out. Uh, typically, you know, at this time of the service, we have a, a section where we call it our watch and pray. Jesus is watch, be aware of things that are happening around our society and our schools and politics, wherever it may be. Be aware so that fear doesn't overcome you and deception doesn't overcome you so that we can be a, a, a light in the midst of the hour of history that we're alive. We asked Justin Sparks, one of our church members, he's also a Missouri State representative, um, he was also a U.S. Marshal, just to help us this week in addressing uh, us as a, as a family here about watching pray. Let's, let's watch this together. 
Hi church, Justin Sparks here, and it's my privilege to bring you the watch and pray moment for this week. As I was praying about what we were gonna talk about, I did a quick Google search, and as of March 20th, here's what you saw. Chuck Schumer, the leader of our Senate, discussing asking the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, to step aside for new elections. Guys, that's inappropriate, outrageous, it's even dangerous. It shows a continued eroding of support from our government for their government in one of their darkest hours. I also saw that the Taiwanese government confirmed the presence of U.S. military personnel in the Taiwanese Strait. That's a big deal when you're talking about the two largest economies, the United States and China, as adversarial nations coming and heading towards a conflict. Here at home, we see the state of Indiana taking a child away from Catholic parents because that child identified as transgendered and the parents disagreed. So the state took that child away from the parents' custody. Our Supreme Court refused to stop that. That's sad and it shows the continued direction our culture's heading. Here in Missouri, transgender care for minors and abortion upon demand up until the day of birth is threatening to come into our constitution in the span of one day, one vote in November of this year. It's a very real possibility. All of these things are troubling and it would be easy to kind of be overwhelmed by them. And I would tell you, don't let your heart be troubled. God is sovereign. He sits on his throne and he has a plan. I would tell you to pray without ceasing. I would tell you to fast and pray, pray intentionally and get on your knees and ask the Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Guys, you all have dreams, visions, and gifts that may have been lying dormant in your own life for a long time. I would just ask you to pray and let those things come to life again. You have a job to do, you have a part to play, and frankly, the role of the church in the last days has never been more important than right now. It's all hands on deck, and I'm encouraged to see you out on the battlefield. God bless you guys. Thank you, Justin. You know, last week, we heard from uh, Adam Schnelte, and he's a, another state rep out in St. Charles County, that was addressing us about this idea of petitions being signed, and we're seeing a lot of grocery stores right now where people are asking people to sign a, a, a petition, and some of the wording and language sometimes can be confusing, and what he was just speaking of as far as abortion rights and even some of the, the transgender rights and males you know, participating in female sports and all of the things that go along with some of the transgender policies are attempting to get into the Missouri state constitution. So we showed that last week just as a reminder and an and informative you know, little piece there that a lot of the legislators are doing, God-fearing legislators. Justin did one as well. We just wanna show it again, just to reiterate the truth because it's really being blanketed right now uh, throughout the state about signing these petitions with language that isn't clear, but there is an agenda behind it. Let's watch this. Well-funded out-of-state special interests are seeking to subvert the will of the people and manipulate our initiative petition process and bring extreme abortion on demand policies and codify them into our constitution. They seek to do this in order to get around the will of the people and permanently bring abortion back to Missouri. But we can do something about it. You can do something about it you can decline to sign. And not only would you be protecting the integrity of our constitution, but you would be protecting the most vulnerable people in our society, which is the unborn. And our society and our state will be judged on whether or not we do exactly that, protect the unborn and keep abortion out of Missouri. Amen, let's do our part. Hey, stand with me if you will this morning. We're just gonna pray, ask the Lord to help us. We take these issues that we hit every week and we take them into our prayer meetings throughout the week and Lord, we just come before you and we do. We lift up our nation, we lift up our state, our city right here in the region in which we live and God, we ask you for help. God, we pray for the hand of God to intervene. Lord, that you would cause there to be just major blessing in our nation, but we understand that that comes as people fear the Lord and set our hearts to obey the scriptures. The scriptures and the boundaries in scriptures don't keep us from joy. They lead us to life and joy. 
God, we ask you for help, for the the power of the Holy Spirit, and for the church, for God-fearing believers, that we would use our voices and our prayers to see shift and a, a change in our country. God bless America. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Thank you for standing. You can have a seat if you'd like. Well, I would encourage you to. We're going to be standing here for a little bit. Of course, I got to stand, so I mean, come on. Well, today is Palm Sunday. It's one of my favorites because of the story. So my attempt today is just, I'm going to just tell the Palm Sunday story. You know, my, my goal in any time I, I tell Bible stories or teach them the Scripture is, is to bring the Scriptures alive. And Palm Sunday is one of the most incredible stories because of what Jesus allowed to happen. And we're going to look at that in a moment. You know, it's leading up, of course, to Holy Week, which is what we call the week leading up to the, the crucifixion, what we call on Good Friday. And then, of course, we know the rest of the story that Ron will be telling us on Easter Sunday on the resurrection. But here is an idea in the Scriptures that we have to really understand a little bit clearer to really get what was happening on Palm Sunday and why it was so powerful. And here's the idea. It's the idea that Jesus is king. Now, we say that, we sing those songs. Actually, some of the songs we were just singing had that language in it. But for a lot of us, when we think of that, we, we just think spiritually. We think that it's a spiritual kingdom only, which is a truth. It is a spiritual kingdom. It's just partially true. It's not just a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom that Jesus will rule and reign as a king goes beyond the spiritual realm, and it absolutely has to do with the natural earthly realm as well. Now, we want to see if the Bible backs that up. You sure that Christianity isn't only just about a spiritual kingdom, but an earthly kingdom as well, which would imply that Jesus is king beyond just the spiritual and also the physical. Let's look, Zechariah 14, 9. I'm going to look at a handful of verses here that speak directly of Jesus as king and not just in the spiritual realm somewhere, but actually here in the midst of the nations on earth with real, you know, real earthiness. Zechariah 14, he says, the Lord will be king over all the earth. This is Zechariah hundreds of years before Jesus came prophesying about the Messiah that would come. So we know that it, it, this verse to mean Jesus, he says, the Lord Jesus will be king over all the earth. And I can imagine him going, just wait, just wait and see. Watch what happens. Another one out of Jesus' own mouth. He understood all of these prophecies. Here's what he said out of his own mouth concerning him. He says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Now that title, Son of Man, was Jesus's, I would say, his favorite title of himself. He's speaking of himself. And a lot of people think that it meant, you know, about God had come in the flesh or that, that God was a human that come in, in, in the form of Jesus. And that's partially true, but it's, it, it, it finds its home in Daniel. Daniel had an open vision in the book of Daniel, and Daniel saw a figure that was like a human, yet it was in the midst of the glory and the throne of God, in the midst of what Daniel called the ancient of days, the uncreated God of glory that created all things. And Daniel said, hold on a second. In the midst of the throne of God, there is one, he said, like the Son of Man. And this Son of Man was more than just a man. This man was fully God. He was equal with the ancient of days sitting on his throne. Daniel was mystified by that. So when Jesus comes on the scene and throughout the Gospels, when he uses this phrase, the Son of Man, I mean, it made the religious people really upset because they knew that he was claiming to be the figure, the man, the, the more than a man that Daniel had saw. So Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, of course, implying as king. All the nations, that's, that's, that's real governments and real people, real elected officials, some not elected officials, anybody that is a ruler or uh, reigning in a, in, a, in a specific country, the nations, it says, will be gathered before him as he executes judgment and counsel, etc. That's what Jesus said about himself clearly implying 
His kingship was more than just spiritual. Another one, Jeremiah 3, 17. Jeremiah says, in that day, the day that Jesus was just speaking of in Matthew 25, he says, in that day, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, many of us have taken trips there. We're going to look at a picture of it here in just a moment. The city of Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord. You know, St. Louis has the, a name. We have the arch and the gateway into the, into the west. It says, well, Jerusalem will also have a nickname. And the name will be the throne of the Lord. Why? Because the actual throne that King Jesus will sit on and the nations will receive their counsel will be in the city of Jerusalem. He says, all the nations will come there to honor the Lord. Psalm 72, verse 11. All kings will bow down before him. All nations will serve him. Again, this is King Jesus that we haven't seen these prophecies come uh, to pass yet. Yet, they're absolutely certain as much as the first coming prophecies were certain, like we see here in Isaiah 9. This is probably one of the biggest ones. Now, we love Isaiah 9 because we tell this story a lot around Christmas when we think of all these prophecies that were concerning the baby, the, the, you know, the baby Jesus. Man, I just had that. Never mind. I won't even go there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to do it. Here we go. We're going to stay focused. Isaiah 9. A child is born to us. We talk about this story Every year around Christmas, I want you to look how packed this passage is about the coming baby, this coming child that would be way more than a normal baby and a normal child. He says, a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders. Now, first you're thinking, okay, government, maybe that's spiritual government only. What government are you talking about? Let's keep reading. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. He, this son, this child, will be called Mighty God. Again, this is, this is what Daniel was saying, Son of Man. This is what Jesus was saying when he said he was the Son of Man. He is more than just a normal man. He will be called Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will only last a four-year term because he's elected in. No, hang on a second. That's not what it says. His government that he establishes that he will rule and reign from in Jerusalem as he sits upon his throne will never end. This is what it means when we think King Jesus. Now, again, this is the story of Christmas about this baby being born of a virgin. This is the Isaiah 9 passage. It's massive. He says he will rule with fairness in his leadership. It says he will rule with justice from the throne of his ancestor David, which we know, of course, was the throne in Jerusalem for all eternity. Now, when you read the scriptures, especially the gospels, you hear this term Messiah. This was the, the term that the, the Jews were expecting because they knew all of these Old Testament prophecies that we just read from Psalm to Jeremiah to Zechariah to Isaiah. They were hundreds of years old. The Jewish families would have taught them over and over as they awaited this coming one, this, this person, this Messiah, this ruler that would come and finally the throne would be reestablished in Jerusalem. I mean, this is what they were expecting when they, when they heard the word Messiah. I just want you to get that in your head because once we get to the Palm Sunday story, you can see the eruption of expectation was because of these prophecies that they were expecting to come to pass. Now, one little side note here. When you look at the gospel stories and you know Jesus calls the 12 and these 12 guys and then he had this other bigger group of men and women that were following him closely, you, you start to see a, a little, you know, a couple little bunny trails where they're they're arguing amongst themselves about who's gonna be the greatest in the coming kingdom. Well, that's because they're not thinking this is gonna be a spiritual kingdom. They understood these prophecies to be real, earthy, that Jerusalem really would be called the throne of the Lord. They understood that when the Messiah came, he really would be a king, and all the other nations, remember, they're under Roman oppression at the time, all the other nations would submit to the leadership of the Messiah. And so we find out all of a sudden that these young guys, mostly fishermen from the north of Israel, they're arguing 
on when he finally does step into this role as king, who are they gonna be in his kingdom? What position will they have in the cabinet? We even see some of that in our own land as far as people positioning around who's gonna be elected and I want this position or that position. They did the same thing. This gives me hope. Here's why this gives me hope. Because they're just as, you know, broken and jacked up as we are. (laughs) Dealing with the same things that we deal with. Here's one of the stories in Mark 10. James and John, two of the key pillar 12 apostles, they come to him and they said, teacher, we want us to do, in another version it says, we want us to do whatever we ask of you. We want us to, you to, to do us a favor. And he says, okay, what's your request? He said, they replied, when you finally go sit on your glorious throne, because by this time, they're mostly just staying in tents in, amongst the poor, you know, serving 15, 18, 20 hour days, healing and, you know, doing all these things and living like they're poor. And they're like, okay, the Messiah come. I didn't quite think poverty. I thought throne in Jerusalem and all the nations come and, you know, give massive gifts of gold, you know, to the king. But I know you're going to. So when you do, we want to sit in places of honor, one on your right and the other on your left. Now, when you read this same story from Matthew's gospel, James and John even went an extra step. They sent their mom in to go talk to Jesus. True story. They wanted this so bad. And they're like, you know, we've done it once. He didn't quite hear us. I don't think he heard us right. I bet mom could twist his arm even more. And they sent his mom in. The reason was because they understood that when the Messiah came, there was a real king and a real throne. And they they were right. They just missed it on timing. But they were really right. These are really true prophecies to come. And the way we know they're right, because Palm Sunday... This is the expectation, and Jesus receives their praise. Again, he just understood there would be a gap of time until he really did rule and reign as a king in Jerusalem. Well, Acts 1, 6, they're still saying it. Even after the resurrection of Jesus, Acts 1 is after the cross. He's been, you know, he died. He was raised again to life, and now here he is. He's, he's, he's appearing to many over the course of many days and weeks, uh, alive and he's resurrected and they're like, okay, now is the time. This is when the apostles were with Jesus. They kept on asking him, Lord, okay, the cross totally threw us for a loop. We didn't see that coming. Now you've been raised from the dead. Now are you finally going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now will you sit on your glorious throne? Of course, he answers them the very next verse. I just didn't put it in here. And he basically says, not yet, but he will. Okay, All of that to get us a mindset of the king and these prophecies about Jesus and the Messiah and the anointed one being a real king with real expectation in the hearts of the Jews to get to Palm Sunday. You know, Palm Sunday, of course, is gonna be the day today when he enters into Jerusalem. Many call it the triumphant entry into the city. And it's gonna kick off what he does Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And of course, we know on Good Friday is when he's crucified. And then of course, we know what happens on Easter Resurrection Sunday. But you know, when I look at this story, I realize throughout all the gospels, Jesus never misses a detail. And you would have thought, okay, all of the, the, the timing, I mean, the, you know, he, he's been ministering for almost three and a half years mostly in obscure villages in the north of Israel where they were small towns. Made a couple of appearances in Jerusalem, but not many. Mostly in small villages, but doing powerful acts. And now he's gonna come into Jerusalem and he knows what's ahead. He he was already trying to bring the disciples and the apostles along the journey of what's about to happen, even though they didn't have ears to hear. But why this week? Why would he choose this week? We know in in Jewish tradition, this would have been the week of Passover. And the city of Jerusalem grew five times during the week of Passover. Passover is when the Jews were celebrating their deliverance from Egypt. We read about that in the book of Exodus. And all of the the Jews around Jerusalem, around Jerusalem, I mean, some days and days of a walk to get to the city, they would all come with their families for a seven, eight-day celebration of Passover. And 
it was such a big Jewish celebration, it would be like St. Louis about, a, you know, in the metro area, let's say a million, growing to five million. Okay, just get that in your head. So Jerusalem grew five times, and he picks that to be the week to initiate Holy Week leading up to the cross and the resurrection. He doesn't miss a detail. I'm gonna read the story of Palm Sunday to us here, and I've used all the gospels fit together, because when you read the Palm Sunday story, each gospel has a little bit of a detail that the other one does, and I'm gonna start in Luke 19. Jesus went on toward Jerusalem. This is towards the end of his three-year ministry. Walking ahead of his disciples, as he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. And he said, I want you to go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Just <laughs> the detail. He says, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, hey, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and they found the colt just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners came and they said, hey, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their garments over it for him to ride. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments and branches on the road ahead of him. Now it's worth noting, we're gonna see this in a moment. John's gonna find this little detail. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't put this detail in there. But it's, it's worth noting that he just was coming through the village of Bethany. I'm gonna show that in a moment on the map. But Bethany is where Lazarus was raised from the dead. And you know what happens when your brother gets raised from the dead? You tell a lot of people about it. That's what happens. So these villages around Mount of Olives leading up to the city of Jerusalem, there was a buzz about this guy. I mean, Mary and Martha would have been, and all those that were there that saw it. Remember, Lazarus was dead for days. He shows up, they're all wailing. He goes before the tomb and he cries out his name and a dead guy that's been dead for days comes walking out. That is gonna spread a little bit. So there's already a buzz before he gets even to Jerusalem. When he reached the place where the road started down from Mount of Olives, Going up to Jerusalem, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all of the wonderful works that they had seen. Now, just for a moment, let's just take a look. Now, I, unfortunately, I, I tried to get a photo from back then, and it, I, it was too dusty, you couldn't see it. So we have a, that was a joke, by the way, <laughs> anyways. So this is a you know, more modern photo that we're looking at of Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And you can't really tell of the terrain. It looks like it's kind of flat, but it's really not. This down here, all this area here would be the, the old city of where Jerusalem was. Like even right over here, you can kind of see some of the wall of the city. Then right up here, you see this area. This is the Temple Mount where you see this big Dome of the Rock. And you see another big wall. This is the Wailing Wall, by the way, right here. So this big wall here was the Temple Mount. It was actually the top of where the old city Jerusalem would have sat. This is where the temple would have been during Holy Week. Jesus is gonna, if you read the story this week, Jesus is gonna go into that temple again and cleanse the temple, right? When he makes the whip, he overturns the money changers. That's where the temple would have been. Now it's, you know, the, the Dome of the Rock is a big Islamic area. It's the second holy site for Islam. Now here, over here, is where the Mount of Olives is at. That, that, this is kind of the ridge of Mount of Olives, but you can't even really tell it's a, it's a ridge. However, if you were to walk from here, you can kind of see way down here the valley that is in between the Temple Mount and Mount of Olives. It's about a, probably a 20, 25, 30 minute walk down, and then a 30 minute walk or so up to the ridge of Mount of Olives. Back there, behind the Mount of Olives, would have where, that's where Bethany and Bethphage would have been which is where he raised Lazarus from the dead. And he tells the disciples, hey, go to those villages and get a colt. You're gonna find it there, bring it to me. And then he begins to ride from the Mount of Olives down, probably would've took a, a lot longer then, because when you walk it now, it's all nice paved you know, roads and sidewalks. But then it would've probably taken him, I would say taken him hours 
to go from the Mount of Olives leading up to the city. So this is Palm Sunday. So now with that visual in mind, taking him some time and the crowd swelling, let's continue the story. The news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. So the word got ahead of him. I mean, we're talking the word is out and there's a holy expectation in the hearts of the people that's been building for three years. You gotta realize that. The news was already sweeping all the way up to Jerusalem. A large crowd of Passover visitors, remember Jerusalem is five times bigger, they took palm branches and went down to the road to meet him. And they shouted, Hosanna! We were just singing that earlier. Which means, God save us! They're singing Hosanna to this man that's from Nazareth. They're saying that he is the anointed one that has come to save us. Praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. I mean, they're using big public titles and exclamations and proclamations about Jesus. And then they say, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. But some of the Pharisees, the religious people, I mean, that was the people that gave Jesus the most trouble, were the ones that were most religious. Their confidence came in their knowledge of the Scriptures, their knowledge, their strength in the Scriptures, not God's own strength. They had no humility. The Pharisees came to Jesus. They're annoyed. They're super upset. And they said, teacher, you hear what they're saying. They understood they're quoting all these Old Testament prophecies. Rebuke your followers for saying things like this. And I love Jesus' reply. Because up to this point, he hasn't replied like this. Up to this point, he's mostly told people to be quiet. When he, was raised, when he raised somebody from the dead, he delivers somebody from a demon, he heals the sick, his next thing would be, now don't tell no one. Because he knew his time hadn't come yet. Well, apparently the time has come. He says, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road, back then they didn't have asphalt and concrete pavement, they were stone roads. He says, if they don't do what they're doing, these stones will rise up and start shouting praises to the Lord. Come on, somebody. He says, they will actually burst into cheers. You gotta, again, remember, three and a half years of build-up expectation is about to erupt. He goes on in John 12, another little detail. Many in the crowd, they had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb. Remember, he just came through Bethany, raising him from the dead. They were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him because they had heard about these miraculous signs that he had been doing. Then the Pharisees said to one another, I like this. They said, there's nothing we can do now. Look, everyone is going after this guy. And then Matthew adds this little detail in Matthew 21. He says, the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. Some had heard, some had not, but they did see the crowd swelling for hours, singing and shouting with a guy in the middle, riding a donkey, and they're saying, this is our king that has come. And they're going, what in the world is happening? You know, let's look at a few details here. Number one is the donkey. Why is that even important? It says in Matthew 21, it says, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble. That's the first thing that sticks out to me. He's humble. You know, most kings may not be humble. Most kings may come into the room and expect you to get out on the dirt and pay them, you know, the respect due because of their position as king. Yet this king was the one who got down in the dirt. This king was the one who was very different. He was humble, riding on a donkey, not a big, you know, chested out white horse, but a donkey. It says they brought the donkey and the coat to him and they threw their garments over the coat and he sat on it. We just read that in Matthew 21. Here's what the crowd is pulling from the Old Testament. 500 years ago, Zechariah 9 says this, rejoice, O people of Zion. It's just another word for the Jews, for Israel. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you he is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, there it is again, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. 500 years, 
the Jews had passed down that story. And all of a sudden, they're alive in the time when a 500-year prophecy is coming to pass right in front of their eyes. And you can imagine, not only that, just out of nowhere, but the three and a half years of buildup of stories. And they're like, yeah, this guy, he's got a little power on him. I watched him take a dead guy out of the grave and the guy had life again. Oh yeah, I was in a boat one time and on the Sea of Galilee and the, the storms came out of nowhere. We were terrified, screaming. We all thought we were gonna die. He was sleeping. We got him up and he spoke a word to the sky and the sky is calmed. There was times that he would go into a village and anybody that was sick, anyone that was sick, not a couple, kinda, maybe healed, anyone that was sick were instantly healed, the whole village. The expectation was building. And here's what I love about the story of the donkey. The idea that Jesus is humble. This is what God is like. Jesus came and he reflected the nature of God. And it says this, he understood that the humility of the cross came before the throne. Again, this is the, the, the declaration of God. He was willing to embrace the humility of the cross before the exaltation of the throne of Jerusalem. Because the throne of Jerusalem is coming. Just keep waiting, it's coming. Jesus is king, but he's also a suffering servant that came to die for sinners so that we might experience freedom from sin. Jesus is tender and he's humble. He's the kind of king that when he walks into the room, even though he is king, he also has a spirit on him that is attractive that draws kids to him. You don't see a lot of kings dressed in all their garb and they don't wanna get a wrinkle on it with a bunch of smelly kids with food all over their fingers running up to him. Yet we see that in the King Jesus. It even annoyed his dirty disciples because they were wanting to get the kids away. He says, no, 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 let the kids come to me. And it was because he possessed a spirit that was attractive. It's called humility. This is the ultimate verse that helps us to see the kind of humble God that we see in the Palm Sunday story. It's John 3, 16, we all know it. This is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. He came riding on a donkey on Palm Sunday. Even though they were exclaiming him as king, he willingly embraced the humility of a suffering servant knowing the cross was ahead of him. God, I say, thank you, Lord. This is what God is like. Well, let's go on. I love the response. In Matthew 21, the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. Others cut branches from the trees and they spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were sh shouting, praise God or Hosanna for the son of David. And blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. Blessed is the king of Israel. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Well, that's another verse that they're quoting. They're quoting Psalm 118. Psalm 118 says this, Lord, please save us. That's that, whole, we were singing it earlier, Hosanna, save us. That's what Hosanna means. It means save us. They're, they're, they're quoting Psalm 118. Again, this is why the Pharisees were so annoyed. It says, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Whenever we see these references in the gospel of the son of David or the Messiah or the coming one or when they're, when they're singing Hosanna to him, because a Hosanna was a request, save me. And again, they're under the oppression of Rome, save me. They're with sickness and death in their bodies, save me. And what a lot of them didn't realize was the spiritual death that they all possessed that he was mostly concerned about to free them, not just from a temporary, you know, uh, a temporary time of being under Roman oppression or a temporary time of having sickness in your body, but an eternal time of sin blinding their hearts and souls and they would be freed forever because of his work on the cross. My goodness, Jesus' response. That's the crowd's response. What's his response? Have the team come and join me. The Pharisees among the crowd, they said, teacher, how dare you? 
How dare you? We know you. You're the son of the carpenter up in Nazareth. You're just a man sleeping out in tents amongst the poor. How dare you? Rebuke your followers for saying these things like that. And then we said this earlier. He said, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Now, here's what stands out to me. What stands out to me is this is the, the first time in a big public way. He did it privately occasionally. But in a big public way with the city of Jerusalem, five times bigger than it typically is, he receives their adoration and proclamation of who he is as the anointed one, the Messiah, the King. Guys, that is why I know all of these Old Testament prophecies aren't just spiritualized. Jesus didn't correct them. Jesus received their adoration because he knows it's true that he is the King. He accepts their ad adoration. The city of Jerusalem is packed and he endorses their claims of his identity. He endorses their claims that he is the coming Messiah, that he is the one that will bring healing. He is the one that can answer the cry of Hosanna and bring salvation. Here's what he says later on in Revelation 5, 12, as this, this buildup of praise, as we see in the book of Revelation, where it says, all the people will sing. It says, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them. He says, I heard them all over and they were singing to the lamb. They said, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Stand with me if you will this morning. Let's get in the spirit of Palm Sunday We've been waiting for the expectation of our King to come and to bring freedom. And let's sing to the Lord this morning.
Come on, let's give a shout of praise to the Lord this morning. Now, I want to just, just, I just want to build up the story just a little bit longer because we know what's coming. The city is erupting in praise on Sunday and erupting in an indictment of murder on Friday when it says the Pharisees stirred up the city and crucify him. You know, just weeks earlier in John 8, Jesus says this. He says, your father Abraham, he's speaking to the religious Jews, the Pharisees. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. And the people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say that you've seen Abraham, which was hundreds and hundreds of years earlier? And Jesus answered, he says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. As he's given these hints of who he is. Now, when you, when you see the rest of the Palm Sunday story, he comes into the city. The city's in an uproar. They're singing all hell, King Jesus. But then it goes on in Luke 19. It says, as he entered, as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep as he was overcome with grief, knowing that the hearts of people in one second would be filled with jubilation. And even his own apostles in, a, in, in just a moment would all deny that they even knew him and flee from him on Thursday night. Remember, he tells Peter, because Peter is just like, are you crazy? The whole city, the whole city was just in an uproar. I am with you to the end. And he tells Peter, he says, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny that you even know me. So Jesus is filled with grief, yet also fully embracing the truth of who he is. Again, this is why we love God, because of knowing what was ahead and seeing the precious souls that are in this room that would be bought by the blood of the cross, he stayed steady. Matthew 20, he says, as he was going up to Jerusalem, this is before Palm Sunday, he took the 12 disciples aside privately and he told them what, he was, what was going to happen. He said, listen, we're going to go up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to death. They will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. Holy Week, so many things are going to happen. I want to encourage you on Friday, move your schedules around on Friday and don't miss this. Take this week to read the story. What happens on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Thursday's a big day when he's with his disciples in the Last Supper. And then, of course, we know on Good Friday we're going to come together and we're going to remember and reflect upon Jesus' commitment to go all the way to the cross. Lord, we just pause for a moment and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that even, even though the crowds of Jubilee wouldn't hang with you all week, that you didn't quit. You stayed steady. You embraced the horror of the cross ahead. God, we bless you that even in the midst of you being king and crowned as the rightful Messiah and Son of God that you are, that you, that you took the path of the cross before the throne. Oh, we love you. We bless you this morning. I'm going to have the prayer team come down, if you will. If you're here this morning and you've never experienced salvation, what it means to have your sins forgiven. Have that weight of shame and condemnation lifted off of you. Maybe you've attended a lot of church, but you've never truly experienced what it means, what Jesus called being born again. Maybe you have questions. Maybe you're here this morning and your, your heart's beating a little quicker than normal. It's because you were made for God. And sin breaks that relationship. And we, in all of our attempts of good works, we just can't do it. We can't free ourselves from the bondage of sin, but Jesus can. He has the power 
to speak a word and to break the power of sin off of our life. This morning, if you've never experienced that and you're saying, I want to, let, it, let us pray with you. Maybe you just have questions. Let us interact with you about some questions that you have. This morning, if you're here and you need prayer for anything, a broken relationship, healing in your body, maybe just hope. You're in a season of just everything going wrong and you need encouragement. Let our team encourage you this morning. Lord, as we go this week, would you bless us? Would you open the scriptures to us? And Lord, get us back here safely on Friday as we celebrate communion and Good Friday together. We love you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you, Grace Church. Have a great holy week. We'll see you back here on Friday. If you'd like to receive prayer, go ahead and come on forward.